Lori. We're already rolling, so whenever you're ready, no rush. Good morning. How are you guys this morning? Go ahead and stand to your feet. We're going to get started with some praise, worship this morning. I can tell you there's already been a shift in the atmosphere just with us practicing this morning, and I'm excited for what God's going to do this morning. Um, for me personally this week, one of the things that I feel like the Lord is doing in my life is he's bringing a new revelation of his love to me. And um, I'm just going to pray that over us this morning because, you know, the truth is when we can have a revelation of exactly how much God loves us, then everything else falls into place because we know that because he loves us so much that things have to align with his will for us. Amen. And so, Lord, I just pray that this morning as we just bask in your presence, God, I just pray for a fresh anointing, a fresh outpouring of your love, God, a revelation of your love for us, God. And I pray that this morning, that as we worship and we praise together, Lord, that you would just fill us up. God, that you would fill us up with a new revelation of who you are and who we are in you, Father. I thank you this morning for every single person that's here. God, I know it's not by chance, Lord, I know that you have every single person here this morning for a specific purpose, God, and what you are going to speak to each one of us. Lord, we are just in anticipation of what you are going to do, Lord. We love you so much. Just tell the Lord how much you love him this morning. All right, so we're going to just sing something in one accord this morning. So you just sing with me. The words are simple. They're not going to be up on the screens. We're just going to sing this part. I just want you to say this. Say, Lord... We welcome you. That's it. Simple song, right? But I want, I want you to just kind of sense something with me. As we begin to just agree with the mindset that, Lord, we welcome you here, I want you to just feel the atmosphere shift in this room, okay? So this morning, it's not weird, but if you're comfortable, just close your eyes, bow your head. And then just start singing this as the Holy Spirit gives it to you. We're just going to start singing it as one accord. Here we go. It's going to be, Lord, we welcome you. We welcome you. Oh, Lord, we welcome you. Let's sing it out in the spirit. We welcome you. We welcome you. God, we just pray a spirit of unity would be in this place this morning. God, I pray that we would understand the purpose of the church was to be a unified front for your kingdom. 
the purpose of your church was where we could gather together. We could meet with you. We could be re-equipped and we could be forced back out into the, our places of influence. So God, today, I pray today would just be a place of equipping, would be a place of recharge. But God, more than anything, I pray a place of unity. Praise you. If you agree with me, say amen. Hug the person next to you. Tell them they're welcome here. There you go. Don't make it weird. Just hug them.
I will rise in confidence. I will see your goodness in the land I'm living in. And no matter where I go, no matter where I've been, I will see your goodness in the land I'm living in. victory this morning when all I see is the mountain you see the mountain come on as I walk and as I walk through the shadows your love surrounds me there's nothing to fear now for I am saved. Come on, we're going to start from the top when all I see. We need those battles this morning. Here we go. When all I see is the battle, you see my victory. You know the end, Lord. When all I see is the mountain, you see the mountain. East is from the west. Come on. As I walk through the shadows, your love surrounds me. Yeah. There's nothing to fear now, for I am saved. Come on, church, I want you to sing this out this morning. Here we go. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh. Battle belongs to you. Every fear I lay at your feet. I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Come on, here we go. And if you are. goes before us, right? All right, so if you believe that this morning, 
then when we sing this next bridge, Almighty Fortress, you go before us, nothing can stand against the power of our God. Okay, so the key word in that today is our. Look to your neighbor and say, our, yours and mine, our daddy, our God, he's already won it. So this morning, our job is, he, he's already won it. Our job the mo this morning is to just let it go, all right? You see the hands up front here? Everyone practice with me. Put your hands up like you're going down a roller coaster. This is letting go. This means you can't grab onto nothing. I know this is hard for us, me especially, but we have to, church. We have to understand that we have to let go. We have to let our God do it. We have to let him fight our battles that he's already won. So as we sing this this morning, this is where it's at. This is the sign of letting go. This is the sign of freedom. The ball's in your court. Here we go. try the more and more my problems show up like I, I just keep trying and everything I try against seems to just keep rising up in me uh, whether it's the, the words I don't want to say I'm constantly saying or the friends I don't want to hang out with or just I, I'm drawn towards these things I'm not supposed to do anyone else deal with those problems okay I'm not alone so Jesus talks about the parable where they've sown the seed that night and then it, in the middle of the night, the enemy comes in and sows tares or weeds in the field to disrupt the harvest. And when the servants come, when they finally realize that the weeds are sown, they're like, so master, do you want us to go and take out those weeds so that they don't affect the harvest? He says, no, because you don't know what you're going to pull out of the harvest that looks like the weeds. And so the master continues watering everything. So just because all these other things are coming up doesn't mean that you're doing bad. It's just mean everything's getting watered at the same time. And when harvest comes, they, then they'll know the difference of, hey, now I can pull out these weeds. But if I would have pulled them out before, I would have destroyed more of what you were going to offer. And I can tell the difference once the water's happened. So don't feel like you're constantly doing wrong. Feel like, God, you're still watering me. I'm seeing all this stuff come up because you're bringing out the good in me also. The victory's already been won. You just seen in the battle in the process. I 
bring it all to peace. Storm surrounding me, let it break. At your name, still, I call the sea to still, the rage in me to still, every way. Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus, you silence fear. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus.
never want to leave. I'm not here. Oh, I'm not here for blessings. Jesus, you don't know me. concept that God doesn't owe you anything. It's an interesting concept, isn't it? When you really think about it and boil it down, the fact is this, and this is what you need to understand. Jesus chose to. He wasn't made to. And if we can really get that into our head, because I think a lot of times we sit there and go, well, that was God's plan, but it, was, it didn't have to be. It didn't have to be. God chose to send his only son to die on a cross for you so that you could have everlasting life. Why? Because he wanted to. More than that, he wanted to have relationship with you. That was the whole concept here. It wasn't so he could save you. It was so he could restore you. See the difference? A savior says, you're now saved. When someone restores you, it's saying, hey, you're now back in good standing with. See the difference? Restoration says, hey, I want to restore what has been lost. What was lost? Relationship. What was lost in the, in the garden that day was relationship. What was restored at the cross that day was relationship. If you go through the motions of church simply just to get the next shot in the arm or the next check mark in your box, it'll never work. It won't, it just, it's a bankrupt system that will constantly beat you up. But if you understand that he didn't owe it to you, it wasn't that he was obligated to, no, he just said, hey, I wanna restore a relationship with my kids. I wanna have a relationship with family again. That's the gospel in a beautiful, beautiful way. Amen. It's good seeing you guys. Alex, is the AC on? It needs to be. I'm in a wool vest and a flannel shirt. We need a AC, folks. No, I picked this outfit. Amen. It's good seeing you guys on a summer day. I didn't know if we could get summer this year. It finally came, and now I think it's going to be here with some vengeance, so uh, the AC must be on. Um, this morning, I wanted to just do a couple quick announcements before we dismiss kids. First is this. Uh, we have Warrior Comp and Warrior Camp coming fast, you guys. We are one week away today, one week away from our Warrior competition, and, and we have not... We just had so much stuff going on with everything else. We've kind of just not really put this to the forefront, but we're going to do it now. You've seen the sign up probably over the last couple of weeks for that. But what is the competition? We had this crazy idea that we built an American Ninja Warrior course, and we've, we built it for this community. But how fun would it be if we put real American Ninja Warriors on it? And so this year, next Sunday at the Agriplex, at uh, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, we are running a pro course with pro ninjas from all over the country coming in to compete. And so with that, a couple things we need. We need help for the setup portion of that. Same song, second verse, right? We're setting up a warrior course. So uh, Friday evening, the 9th, we are going to be at the Agriplex setting up 10th. Thank you. Friday the 10th, we'll be setting up the course starting at 6 o'clock in the evening. Our goal for Friday is to set the trussing and all main obstacles 
and then the finish work will be done on Saturday. So what if, if you open your app, you're going to see the opportunity to sign up for that. What I'm going to say is this. If you sign up, uh, there's not an actual slot for setup in there. But if you do sign up, I will contact you or someone will contact you and we'll get you on the setup team. So if you could do that, if you want to give your Friday night, it, it, that's why I said it's not on there. Just sign up for a volunteer and I'll contact you. I have this quizzical look from my, my boss back there when it comes to app. No. There's just a sign up for Warrior Camp, but if you sign up today and you look like someone that wants to set up a course, you'll get a phone call from me. Nope, you're good. So make sure you sign up. It's, it's going to take us around three hours to get accomplished. We got lights, so we can turn those on. Uh, but if we can play our cards right, we can get this knocked out. We're getting faster at it. So we're going to be getting that set up on Friday night. And then make sure that you start spreading the word. Why have we gone to the last minute on this? Well, Thursday night, I found out that our venue changed and a little bit of everything else. And so it's been a bit of a stressful week when it comes to Warrior Camp and Warrior Competition. But uh, I know that God has all things in store and in plan to make it work well. So we are in the Agriplex. It's going to be an amazing time. We'll be in the actual arena with the course. So make sure we get people there. It'll, you won't want to miss Sunday afternoon. And then camp. Camp starts on the 14th in the evening. And so youth, if you are interested in warrior camp this year, there is not a youth dedicated camp, but youth can sign up as helpers and there'll be a youth dedicated night on Wednesday. Uh, but you guys are going to be able to get on that course as well. Kids, we would love to have you make sure we fill up our warrior camp. We already are almost halfway to full. Uh, and I know that this week it'll fill up fast. So uh, just a couple things about Warrior Camp. So get on the app, sign up for the setup portion. Like I said, there won't be a specific spot for that, but just for the camp, sign up. We'll get this set up and we'll do that. One other thing, there's not a sign up for it yet, but I want you to start thinking and praying about this. Uh, how many people understand that there is an agenda right now of violence in this nation? And, and I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I'm going to tell you right now, there is, there is an agenda to take your freedom away from you. And, they're, and we're seeing systematically them doing this. They want to instill fear in the middle-class America against firearms. And so churches will be in the crosshairs of this. We're going to see a lot of things take place. And so with that being said, um, it is vital and important that we have a very solid security team here at Impact. I would say we have a very loose security team right now. Uh, I would I pity anyone who's dumb enough to try something here, but uh, at the same time, I'd rather have a very well-trained security team. So if you are interested in being part of a security team, Josh Marshall, why don't you raise your hand? Josh is, is our security team leader. There will be a sign-up coming up where you have the opportunity to sign up for the security team. What does that look like? It will look like opportunities for you to be on staff here as, as security, but also uh, it's going to be training. Because you're no good if you don't train, right? It requires you to get into the field. So uh, we're going to be doing that. We're in the process right now of making sure that that's available. So uh, just pray about that because this is what I don't want. I don't want anyone to be like, yes, I'm definitely going to do that because that will stroke my ego or make me feel big and bad on Sunday morning. I want you to do it because you're called to do it. I want you to do it because that's what God wants you to do. So just keep that in mind, okay? With that, kids are dismissed to Impact Kids Church. As I was praying about this morning and what to bring forward, I had a couple ideas. Uh, I have one more leadership-based sermon, and, and I prepped that, got that ready, and God says, no, I don't think that's where we're going today. And so as I was praying about, God, what does this really look like? Where do you want to take us? Um, interestingly enough, a lot of what Lori had worship-wise ties into what we're doing, but today I want to talk about the concept of how do you get back up? So often, I'm very much driven by uh, take-the-hill concepts. 
I'm, I'm the type of guy that wants to always be on the winning side, right? And, th- and that's good. That's how God had created me and God intended for me to be. But this is the thing that I realized. How many people understand that every single person fails? If you don't, then you're naive. If you, if you feel like you never fail, that means that you truly don't understand what failure looks like. So how do we get back up? In the moment of our failure, how do we get back up? And to start this concept or this, this topic, I want to read for you a story or tell you a story. The story starts at a track and field event, a college, a D1 college track and field event. In this track and field event, there were two ladies that were picked to be the winners of this event. The event was the 400-meter hurdle. Going into the meet, there was no clear winner or loser between these two, just the fact that it was going to be one of those two. It was obvious that looking both of them that they were both in superb physical condition. They prepared themselves for this moment. As they and all the other female competitors took their marks, you could see the determination and focus in all of these women's eyes, but when the gun went off, it became quickly apparent it was really a competition between two women. One by one, they jumped. It would be hard to determine who would win the race until all of a sudden, out of nowhere, one of the ladies unexpectedly tripped and fell. It was, it was ugly. I'd describe it as a yard sale. She lost it. It was a hard fall. The audience gasped, nationally televised. That camera focused in on her. And as a national audience looked on, you could see the tears running down her face. As the medics come running out onto the field, because it was that bad of a wreck, she composed herself, got up, waved at the crowd, picked up her face, and walked off of the track. Who is this person, this collegiate athlete who fumbled a 400-meter hurdle? That collegiate athlete was Queen Quideth Clay Neil Harrison. may not know who that is. That person, this lady, went to the 2008 Summer Olympics where she took second in 400-meter hurdles. Why do I tell that story? I tell that story because... The day she fell was one of her first college track meets. Not the Olympics, not the Olympic tryouts, a college track meet. She later went on after that, or before that fall, she got brought into, the, uh, into Virginia, into the University of Virginia Tech, where she was elected, uh, or she was selected to be part of their track team. She later on was placed in the Hall of Fame with Virginia and was the only female track athlete to ever compete in the Olympics. Why do I tell the story about the queen? I tell the story because she fell. She fell. Everyone who ever watched that race that day, who then watched her run to take second, to take silver in the 2008 Olympics, was probably standing in a place of going, wow, what does it look like to get back up? How many people understand, and Casey asked the question, how many people are in a battle? I think so often what we do is this. We sit there and say, okay, yeah, God, we know that you already won. We know all of these things, right? But the truth is, that's almost worthless when we're in the moment of the failure. Because we know that's who God is, and we know that's his nature, but in this moment, this moment of my brokenness, how do I really know that? How do I really know, God, who you are, where you're at? Life's a journey, you guys. Life is a journey that's a day-by-day, moment-by-moment, isn't it? Every single day we wake up and we have to make a choice. I've got this band on my wrist. It says, choose. Choose. Why do I wear this band? When I worked at the power plant, I had written on the bottom of my hard hat, not a hint. And on the back, it said, choose. Why? Because I find, for me personally, that every day I can look at something, I can get that reminder to realign myself with who God says I am. Choose this day whom you will serve. Not a hint, not a hint of any immorality, sexual immorality, any other. It goes on and talks about all the immoralities. Why? Because God's calling us to be something so much more. I'm going to knock this over. 
something so much more. So every single day when we wake up, we need to realize that life's a journey, and it can be very difficult at times. It's not always perfect. How many people have ever come to a church and realized or seen this persona that you have to have it together to be here? One of the things that we've really tried to do at Impact, what we're continuing to try to do at Impact, is make sure that you realize that isn't who you are. You don't have to have it all together to be here. Because the only person who can put the pieces together is Jesus Christ, not you. The only person is Jesus Christ. James 1, 2 says, count it all joy when you face, when you fall into divers' temptations. What? I'll read it again. Count it all joy when you fall into divers' temptations. That's a messed up piece of scripture. It didn't say count it all joy when you succeed over them. It has a very interesting word in there. What does it say? Fall. What does fall say? What does that mean? What does it mean to fall into something? It means to fail. It means to go into. He's saying, you know what? Count it all joy when you get to the point of temptation. When you get to that point, because this is what you need to realize. In that moment is when God can be brought forward. In that moment is where Jesus Christ, the work of the gospel, the work of the cross can come forward and be completely and utterly shown through your life. The other thing is this. How many people understand that whenever we have those moments is when we actually understand what we're made of? You know, I've, you've heard my story of the trees and the dome and the, and the root system issue. If we don't ever see the, the struggles of life, we never actually build the tenacity for life. Weak is what I would describe the church. Christians, as a whole, the growing up in the church concept Christians, I considered weak because they hid behind things instead of face things. But God is calling forth a group of men and women in this day and age who will sit there and go, you know what? Every morning when I wake up, I understand I'm on the journey. and I know that it'll be tough. However, one thing we need to keep in mind is we're not alone. That's it. You have to understand it doesn't matter how much you put on that show. You're never going to be good enough. And that's not a slam. That's just the reality. So what happens when we fall? What happens at that day whenever that rifle or when that pistol shot went off and that 400-meter hurdle started? You need to realize, I think she was three hurdles from the finish line. And I will say this, the better the athlete, the worse the spill. Because she was, she had, I mean, it was full throttle. How do we get up? So I want to give you guys a couple pointers, and then we're going to get into the Scripture. If you have, your, if you have the Word, open up 2 Samuel 11, 1 through 4, and we're going to look at my Old Testament hero and probably one of his biggest failure moments, and we're going to dissect it. So as you're doing that, surely all of us have fallen in some area of our lives, and it would appear that it would be so much easier to stay down than get back up. I'll say that again. How many people think it's easier to stay down than get back up? Absolutely. Now, there are some people in the room, oh, no, it's easier to get back up. No, it isn't. Nonsense. Nonsense. Physically, it would be so much easier. How many people have ever watched football, and you see the guy that misses the block that gets flattened, right? It's so much harder to get up after you miss the block than if you would have made the block and gotten flattened, right? You've seen that before where you're like, that hurt. I don't know. I don't think they're physically hurt. I think they're emotionally hurt in this moment. Their ego is in pain as much as their body's in pain. And I think that we need to understand that in those moments of our failure, it's hard to get back up. But here's a list of things you need to keep in mind. Get back up despite the feelings of apathy. How many people understand the longer you feel something, the easier it is to feel it? It becomes your normal place. Winners have to understand that apathy can't be part of your diet. 
we don't get to eat apathy. Winners don't have that option. So get back up despite the feelings of apathy. Second of all, get back up despite the depression. You want to know what's amazing? The enemy goes, hey, you failed. You call yourself a Christian and you sin like that? I know what you said. I know what you did. I know what you looked at. I know what you thought. It's amazing how the ticker tape rolls, isn't it? And what does that lead to? It leads to the depression. It leads to the concept of, I don't think I can do this. I don't think I'm capable of doing this. I don't know if I'm good enough to do this. And we sit there and we lay and, and, and frankly, we can wallow in our own depression. So one, apathy. Second, depression. Third, get back up despite the naysayers. Isn't it amazing how... Uh, I'll use an example. How many people have ever turkey hunted? You want to know the best thing to bring along if you're turkey hunting? Another hunter. Another hunter. Why? You want to know why? Because if you have a group of toms come in, when you shoot the first one, Erica, what do they do? They attack it. So you dump the first turkey, the first tom hits the deck, right? You trip the shotgun loose or whatever you shot and the turkey flopping and everything. All of a sudden, every tom within 40, 50 yards is running over to pounce on top of it and jump on it. Why? Because it's nature to want to attack that which is down. Same thing happens to Christians. And the worst is by Christians. I'm so glad I don't deal with what you deal with. Right? We say it, we laugh, but the reality is we do it. You know, I've come to the conclusion the difference usually is, is theirs went public and yours didn't yet. But we also know that sin will always find you out. So really, at the end of the day, if we're talking about this concept, and I'm, I don't give much space to sin in my sermons because at the end of the day, I think that's absolutely a waste of our time. But I will say this, what we do in the moment of our failure will be what dictates our future. So that's why it's important to talk about this. In your moment of struggle or your moment of failure, you have some decisions to make. One, don't let the apathy become your norm. Don't let the depression become your place. Don't let the naysayers be the ones that dictate your future. And third, or fourth, make sure you understand what's lies and what's truth. That's how you get back up. You understand what's a lie and what's truth. When the enemy, when other people, when yourself, when yourself tells you what's the lie, you need to sit there and you go, hey, you know what? I know what God says about me. One of the things that Lori had a couple of years back uh, as she was walking through an idea of, an, of her identity in Christ, she put a list up on the wall, and it was all of the identity scriptures. It was on the mirror in our bathroom. Brand new house, and I got scotch tape on my mirror. It's fine. I've forgiven her. But it was a list, and it was all these scriptures. Why? Because sometimes in the moment of our frustration, in the moment of our weakness, in the moment of our failure, it's really important, even just in the moment of us just sitting there going, I just feel beat up today, to start reading about what God says about you. Line after line. Because when you start doing that, all of a sudden, you put a different perspective to what you are, who you are. So your own negative talk, the things the devil says, the things other people are saying, you need to make sure that you are telling yourself truths instead of lies. Because if you don't understand the truth of who you are, then you'll believe the lie of who you are. And you know what's so amazing? This is, this, this is the most amazing part that I've come to the conclusion of. The enemy would much rather you believe the lie about who you are than eliminate you. And let me explain why. Because if you can go from a place of freedom to a place of bondage, believing a lie that the enemy or someone else has told you, then you then at that point turn into cancer in the body. 
The enemy's dirty. He plays dirty. He does not care about cheap shots, and he'll take you right where it hurts. So what would I rather? Would I rather you be eliminated, or would I rather you be someone that actually tears other people down? Negativity. Can I tell you right now, I'm allergic to negativity. If you want to be negative around me, go find someone else. I've eliminated people out of my friend list because of negativity. Oh, that's not nice. No, that's just truth. Why? Because God wasn't negative. God is not negative. If you think, if you're a glass is half empty person, then you will always see the negative in the situation instead of the positive in the situation. Revival on front row. But ultimately, so we have the apathy, the depression, the naysayers, the negative talk aspect, but then finally this, whatever you don't, don't stay motionless. Move. Move. Get up. Get up. Can I tell you there's nothing wrong with feeling sorry for yourself for about 30 seconds. Now get up. That girl, when she, when she tumbled off that hurdle, First of all, she was probably trying to find her marbles again. Second of all, it was the pure pain of failure. But then what did she do? Before the medics ever even made it to her, what was she doing? Getting up. She was interviewed afterwards, and they asked a very simple question. What does this mean to you? And she says, it means that the success will be a lot sweeter next time. How do we view life and how do we do this? Let's look real quick at 2 Samuel 11. So the story goes that King David was in the height of his reign. The guy was killing it, literally, because he was killing everything. Um, He was doing what the Israelites never did, and that was eliminate all the ites. He was cleaning out the kingdom. He was doing what God originally had asked. And so David was stepping forward into his kingdom, and and he he had two moments, I feel, two moments in his life as a king that he allowed something to happen that's very detrimental, and that was ego entered. This was one case. The second was when he wanted his army to be counted. The first one, though, was David, and we're going to just read, start in 11.1, and I know this is a rough passage to read because it is truly the, the failure of a king, but in the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole army's Israelite army. I want to stop right there. That is wrought with problems. Because it said, in the spring, when the kings go out to war, what does that mean? Where was David supposed to be? Out at war. Who went instead? Joab. Was it Joab's job? No. It was whose job? David's job. Was he still at a fighting age? Absolutely. Why did he not? Because he got to the point of understanding, pretty good army, pretty good commander, pretty good kingdom. You know what? I'm just going to hang out this year. I'm going to sit this one out. What happens? One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, isn't that Bathsheba, the daughter of Elam, the uh, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him. He slept with her. Then he went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David saying, I'm pregnant. Oh, no. Can I just say right now, King David's wheels just fell off. We can go through and talk about all the things he did wrong. We don't need to talk about all the things he did wrong. We all have a brain. We can see that. But I want to talk about two things. Number one, who's Uriah? Wrong. That was the husband, actually. Uriah the Hittite was one of David's mighty men. 
If you go and, and at the end of David's life, you can see, I'm glad you're paying attention, though. So close. You did. They're all weird names. Who names their kids stuff like that, right? Um, Abby, please don't. Uriah's out, okay? Um, so what, what you have to understand is this. Uriah was one of David's mighty men. This is not something simple. This means that David's mighty men were the men that David surrounded himself with. They were his best. They were his elite. They were with him before he was king, or at least reigning king. He was a friend of Uriah's. He knew him in that way. And so David here, not only did he fail morally, but he had his friend killed. As the story unfolds, they, he, he brought Uriah home. He's like, hey, sleep with your wife. And he goes, I will not do that as long as the men are in the field. I cannot do that. He had honor. Instead of David sitting down and saying, hey, I've sinned before you, before God. You need to forgive me, but the, the, the child your wife carries is mine, not yours. No, instead, he calls up Joab and says, hey, throw him in the front. Let's make sure that he fails. Make sure that he doesn't make it home. And he didn't. This is a low moment, you guys. Talking about a fall, this is a fall. If you go ahead one chapter to 12, we get to see where Nathan rebukes David. David at first, as they're talking about this story of a ewe lamb who is taken and stolen from a young man by a, 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 man, a very rich man, and, and David's like, this man should be put to death, and Nathan goes, that man is you. David does something very interesting, something that sets him apart from all the rest. He turns around and he writes some psalms, in his brokenness, he puts on sackcloth and ashes and he repents. And why is that so incredibly important? Because Nathan got back up. He lost his son out of the deal. Sorry, David got back up. He lost his son out of the deal. The son that was born to him in Bathsheba did pass away. But this is what you have to understand. In his biggest moment of failure, with a prophet standing there, David repented. Don't make me separate you two. If King David can fail like that and pick himself back up, we can pick ourselves back up. I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to make the game-winning shot, and I failed. I have failed over and over and over again in my life. Who, who, whose quote was that? Michael Jordan. And the last part was this, and that is why I succeeded. Michael Jordan played 15 seasons for the Bulls and the Wizards. He averaged 30.1 points. Per game, 6.2 rebounds, 5.3 assists, 2.3 steals. In 1,072 regular season games, he was selected to play in, all, in 14 All-Star games. He won Rookie of the Year Award. He, play, he won Defensive Player of the Year Award five times. He was uh, considered MVP six times. Uh, and six NBA championships. He was also introduced into the Hall of Fame in 2009. But what about all the failures? He found those are what defined him in a positive sense. So when we look at life, this is the thing I'm trying to get down to, and I want you to understand, failure is a part of life. Failure is where we learn. Failure is where we steal ourselves. Failure is where we put the edge back on. Failure is where we sit there and get a wake-up call. Can I tell you, if you always succeeded, you would be weak. If you always succeeded, you would be a failure, in my opinion, because you never knew what it felt like to pick yourself back up and realize that didn't work. And so what we've done as the church, we've tried, to, we've tried to water down the concept of failure. We've watered down the concept of righteous living. Why? We don't want to make the bar too high. 
We don't want it to be something you have to actually fight for. We don't want it to be something you need the Holy Spirit for. Instead, do it in your own strength. Make it work. I don't care how you act tomorrow as long as you act good here today. And I'm going to tell you, it doesn't matter how you act here. It matters how you act tomorrow. Anyone can put on the facade, the mask. But how do you act tomorrow? David thought, man, I think I got her. I got her whipped. God's like, hey, Nathan. Why don't you go have a talk with that boy? But can I ask you a very simple question? Do you think David, so this is King David, the David that was known for sneaking into the tabernacle to write psalms in the Holy of Holies. This is David that was out there with a harp, waking up, playing onto God, falling in love with God. This is the David who had put his harp in the window so that the morning winds would make the strings purr or or strum that would wake him up so that he could have his time with his God. This is the David that was called a man after my own heart. Do you think that his relationship with God in that time was where it was supposed to be? Or do you think God is like, I miss David? I would rather send Nathan to rebuke David so I can have my David back. That's the God that we serve. A God that says, you know what, I'll bring you to a point of revealing and a very painful. Do you think David enjoyed the revealing? Do you think David enjoyed the fact that all of a sudden the rumor mill of Israel's spinning with the fact that David killed one of his mighty men because he stole his wife? No, but God says, I would rather you be uncomfortable so that you can be back into relationship with me. So if you have an area of, in your life that desperately needs a God touch, you need to understand something very clearly. God doesn't care about revealing your sin so it can restore your relationship. Your momentary un- discomfort is worth way more to him because of your long-term relationship with him. So how are we going to get up? Maybe it's a sin issue. Maybe it's a marriage issue. Maybe it's a failed business. Maybe it's a situation where, you know what, I'm going to make this happen because because this is the dream, but then you just keep getting kicked in the teeth. How many people have ever been kicked in the teeth when it comes to a a dream? Maybe not. I'm not literally saying kicked in the teeth. I'm saying figuratively. Everyone looks at me like, haven't had the boots put to me recently. I'm going to give you guys a list. I'm going to see if you can guess who it was. Lost job. 1832. Defeated for legislature. 1832. Failed in business in 1833. Elected to legislature in 1834. Wife dies, 1835. Had a nervous breakdown, 1836. Defeated for Speaker of the House in 1838. Defeated for the nomination for Congress, 1843. Then elected to Congress, 1846. Lost renomination in 1848. Rejected for land officer in 1849. Defeated for Senate in 1854. Defeated for the nomination of Vice President in 1856. Again defeated for Senate in 1858. Elected President of the United States in 1860, Abraham Lincoln. Decisions. Guys, I don't know about you. I would have probably stopped about halfway through the list and been like, they don't want me. But he, he held the helm through one of the most turbulent times of our nation's history. He had to make more decisions, hard decisions, than any other president in the, t- in the history of America. Why? Because he knew what failure felt like. God was designing his entire mindset for the moment he would have to take and mend together a broken country. Because he knew what failure felt like. And you guys, this is what you have to do. I would challenge you today, embrace failure. Andrew said it. You know what? God God's allowed these things in our lives so it can make us who we are. He'll go through with that winnowing hook and he'll take out which is not of him. 
But whenever you fell down on your face and you're in the mud and you're in the blood and you're in the moments where you're like, I don't know if I can come back from this, know this. That's what makes you who you are. Our biggest moments of defeat will be his biggest moments of success. All depends on how you get up. Every person in this room today has choices to make. We live in a world where the the enemy has made it really easy to fail. Isn't it? Really easy to fail. But this is the best part about it. We live in a world where God has made it really easy to succeed to. To get back up. You know, it was interesting. uh, Donnie, do I have permission? Donnie did jail ministry yesterday. I visited Donnie in the same room that he was able to speak life into people five times, five years ago. It's like I didn't visit you five times, I don't think. Five years ago, Donnie sat in the same room on the other end of the table. Why? Because he fell down. But Donnie chose not to stay down. He chose to get back up. Now, this is the beauty. Donnie had the opportunity to sit there and look him in the eyes and say, I know what you're going through because I was there. How amazing is it that God can take a story and go, you know what, there's failure in the midst of this story, and I'm going to turn it into your place of success. I'm going to turn it into your place of breakthrough, where you can look in the eyes of those, those people that are walking the road that you walked in some way, shape, or form and say, hey, God's got big plans for your life. How cool is that? That's the God I serve. He flips the script, you guys. The world says, oh, record. God says, opportunity. The world says, failure. God says, experience. The world says, too far gone. God says, just about seasoned perfectly. Right? The world says, hopeless. God says, never met one. So I don't know where you're at today. I don't know who this is for. But as I read this story, and I I literally skip over the 11th chapter of 2 Samuel because in my mind, I know the story and I don't want to relive it again. David's my hero, you guys. If there's an Old Testament, why I love David so much is because he loved God so much and he failed so real. I can relate. I get it. He's someone I could actually look at and go, you know what? He failed just like I did. Now, the only thing I need to figure out is how to love God like he did. But I'd skip over this. Why? Because I don't like reliving it. It's cringeworthy for me. Because I can sit there at the 30,000-foot view and I can go, David, 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 just go to war. David, don't go on the roof. Don't call her. Look away. Don't mess up your family. But afterwards, we get some of the best psalms ever written by David. Because in a place of brokenness, I'm going to tell you guys, the best place to preach from, the best place to walk in, the best place to minister from, the best place to parent from is a place of brokenness. Because you get out of the way real fast and let God get in real fast. So this morning, I I just want, Hun, would you mind? Elena, would you mind? As we, we're going to go into communion. And I I was asking God this morning, you have to understand there's, there's a couple things that make ministry hard. And that is, how do you keep things fresh? How do we not just get stuck in ruts? I got my board members come forward at this point. I'm going to also hand this to you. Come here. Come here. No. Um, so this is the thing you guys have to realize. 
Communion is something that gets stuck. We just do it over and over again, right? And so what I want to do this morning is I want you to understand something completely different. Communion was with a whole bunch of failures. He shared communion with Judas. He shared communion with Peter, who's going to deny him. And he says, hey, guess what? I'm going to use these people to build my church even. I'm going to go a step further. Can I tell you one stipulation for being a part of impact? Just be honest. Just be honest. I'll take honesty any day over perfection. Because at the end of the day, that's what's going to make a difference. So as you guys pass this out, and we talk about this, Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, says, hey, take this, and any time you break it, I want you to do this in remembrance of me. And so what we have to understand is this. We've turned that into a cup and a piece of bread one Sunday a month. Or maybe if you're more from a, a liturgical or traditional church, maybe it's a, <laughs> a shared cup, or at least before COVID. <clears throat> it was a shared cup once a week. Neither is right. Because if we were being honest, what was, what was Jesus saying? He says, anytime you eat, anytime you break the bread, anytime you take the cup, anytime you come together for a meal, do this in remembrance of me. What is a meal? Let's talk about that concept. What's a meal? Number one, it's, it's a necessity, right? A meal is a necessity. How many people here... Okay, anyone need gluten-free? We do have some gluten-free. Is anyone celiac or gluten intolerant? We got one in the back. Perfect. Just make sure Josh can snag you because he has the gluten-free. So a meal is necessity. No one here is okay with going long-term without food. You might fast for a time, but you will die. There will come a point where you will expire because of lack of nutrients. Right? So Jesus is saying, hey, anytime you partake in something you need, anytime you take part in something that is surrounded by what? Family, community, fellowship. Anytime you eat, do it in remembrance of me. What? Wait a second. Perspective? Yes, perspective. Jesus is saying, hey, I want you to make your meals dedicated around me. Why do we pray before a meal? Have you ever thought about that? Well, because my parents did, and their parents did, and their parents did. Have you ever met the person who prays like the most beautiful, eloquent, 10-minute long prayer before a meal? They drive me nuts. I want to eat. It's getting cold. Be quiet. Uh, I always said, if someone has to pray a long prayer before a meal, it means they don't have a prayer life outside of meals. God and I already had a conversation about it. We don't need to now. But I do want this. As we move forward, and if we can get nursery covered as well, our nursery workers and our kids' workers, as we walk through this, this is what I want you to think about today. If you take nothing else home from communion, take this home. Every time we eat... Every time we take and break bread, we sit down as a family. I want you to remember the sacrifice. A sacrifice that says, hey, you know what? I want to restore. Not forgive. Not atone. Restore you. Why is restoration so important? I started with it, and I'm going to end with it. Because restoration has everything to do with relationship. A pardon is given for someone you don't care about. 
Some of you may not be aware, but uh, there was a young, or well, not young now, there was a young lady that was put in prison 23 years ago because of a crime she committed. Darla Rausch was her name. Look up the story. I don't have time for it. But Darla Rausch committed a crime. She was put in prison. She was made an example because of it. I got to know Darla a couple years ago, and I got to see a gal that is now in her 40s that uh, has spent her pretty much whole adult life in jail. And, and I got to see a beautiful testimony of God's saving grace. And one of the things that for me is really fun in my position is I get to go into rooms no one gets to go into. And I get to have conversations where no one gets to have conversations. And I used that privilege and I walked into Governor Gordon's office and I said, hey, let's have a conversation about a young lady named Darla Rausch. I believe that she had a 56-year sentence, you guys. She never hurt anyone. She held some people at gunpoint because her boyfriend told her to. And she'll spend the rest of her life in jail. And I said, I believe that I serve a God who has grace. And I believe that we should have a DOC system and a DOJ system that uh, shows grace where grace deserves to go. And he pardoned her. She gets released. Um, why do I say that? A pardon has no relationship. He doesn't know her. I do. I was able to walk in there and say, hey, I, I laid out the facts. And I said, her paperwork will come across your desk in the next two weeks. I would challenge you and I will pray that you sign that pardon. She did. Pardons are for those that don't have relationship. Right? God wants to restore. So every day, whenever you take and you break the bread or you take the cup, it has everything to do with relationship. So this is the thing I'm, I'm giving you. Communion's once a month at impact, but communion's three times a day in your home. As a family, taking communion. So this week, instead of thanking God for all the things you thank Him for, or maybe even throwing out your laundry list of needs before a meal, I'm going to challenge you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really just break your mold. I don't want you to pray before the meal for the meal. You have to realize if God wanted you dead, you'd be dead, okay? So you don't need to pray for the safety of the meal you're about to eat. I want you to do this. When the family's sitting at the table, maybe you're not a family around the table type, you got to be this week. Break the mold. I want you to sit down. Maybe it's just you and your spouse. Maybe you're by yourself. Maybe you're alone because you're single. But I want you to sit there, and as the meal sits in front of you, I want you to say a very simple prayer. And that prayer is, God, thank you for sending your son to die on a cross so I could be restored. God, as I partake in communion today, and that communion may be a burger and fries, it may be a roast beef sandwich, maybe a piece of pizza, maybe some lasagna, I don't care what it is, it doesn't matter. As you sit there and you take and you partake together, or even just by yourself, make that meal all about that sacrifice. Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took the bread and he broke it. And he says, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's pray. God, I thank you for the broken body. God, I thank you for the ultimate sacrifice. God, I thank you for the opportunity we have to get back up because of what was done on that cross. Because, God, you said there is no sin too great. There is no place too far that we could not be surrounded by your love. You pursue us. You run hard after us. You love on us. You are there for us. So, God, I just pray right now 
that as we take this together and as this week, the challenge goes out to always remember every meal, every opportunity, remember that sacrifice. We thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's partake. Scripture goes on to say in the same way after supper, he took the cup and he says, this is the new covenant in my blood which was broken for you. A new covenant. A new start, a new beginning. How many people like fresh starts? Right? Hey, let's just stop. There have been times in Lori and I's marriage where we've, we've just hit the pause button on our marriage for a moment and said, okay, I think we got off to the wrong foot on this one. Can we just hit the reset button? Start this conversation over. Let's take a 20-minute cool down and just figure this one out again. Jesus Christ gave us the ultimate restart. He says, this is what you're guilty of, and this is what the consequences are. But on second thought, my son's going to take the punishment. Restart. This is the best part about God. God's always only one decision away from a restart. Oh, you failed? That's okay. There's a restart. You fell back into addiction? That's okay. There's a restart. You're broken? That's okay. There's a restart. Because there's a new covenant. So God, we thank you for a new covenant. We thank you for the spilled blood of Jesus Christ. God, you're not looking at us and going, oh, man, I wish they'd figure it out someday. Even though maybe that's what we deserve. Instead, you sit there and say, wow, I do love my kids. So God, I just pray that as we have seen once again, just even this morning, the fact that you pick up broken pieces and make beautiful things out of them. God, I thank you for the blood that was spilled to make that reality. We don't take it lightly. God, we don't mourn over it. We rejoice over it. Because today we have a new start, a fresh start. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's partake. Finally, I want to ask you guys a simple question. If you're here today and you're stuck down, let me say that again. If you're here today and you're stuck down, you know what I'm meaning. You haven't gotten back up. Maybe you've been laying on the dirt for a long time. Maybe it's been a short time. Maybe you are even contemplating not getting back up. I want to give you an opportunity. It's a good place. It's a good time to get back up. Amen? So if you're here today and that's you, I want you to do something very, just, just be honest with me. I want you to raise a hand. I'm stuck down and I need to get back up. Good. Okay. So this is the best part. We can't get up on our own sometimes. If you're, already, if you're still stuck down, it means that you couldn't get up on your own. So I want you to keep those hands raised. And this is no shame, guys, because we've all been there. We've all been stuck down. I want you to look around now, and we're going to surround these people that are like, hey, you know, I've been stuck down. Okay? I've got three right back in this little quadrant here. I've got two right here. I've got a couple in the back. I'm putting you out of your comfort zone. Keep those hands raised on me. One in the back. Okay. I got Diane, you with her? Awesome. Okay, two back here. This means you move. This is the opportunity for you to get out of your seat and do something. Okay. This is good, you guys. This is what family does. We don't hurt alone, you guys. You realize that, right? We don't hurt alone. We hurt together. We don't rejoice alone. We rejoice together. We don't mourn alone. We mourn together. We don't win alone. We win together. So now I want someone who's going to be the lead prayer in this situation. Just ask, what areas can we pray over? Just get a specific. And as they play, you pray.
I can do all things to him who gives me strength. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. But he said, what is impossible with man is possible with God. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I'm more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. That's what God calls us. That's our identity. That's who we are. More than a conqueror. Isolation is the enemy's game. If you can isolate yourself, he wins. Because you're silent in that moment. No one to speak truth in. Only the enemy to speak lies in. Don't fall down alone. You don't have to. Scripture says, I pity the man who falls alone, for there's no one there to get him back up. When you're in a family, there's someone to pick you back up. There's someone to sit there and go, wow, that's not you. This is you. If identity is the issue that's hiccup as a hiccup for you and you're getting stuck on, I would challenge you to make the list of scriptures. That's a homework piece. Make them and read them. Laminate it. My wife laminates everything, right? Laminate that thing. Scotch tape on the mirror. Write that out. Make it plain, right? Make a dream board or a vision board. Set forward. This is it. Make the plan. Work the plan. It's very simple, you guys. It's so simple that we'd overdo it. <laughs> Make the plan. Work the plan. Don't do it alone. And wake up and realize that God's got bigger things for you than you could ever imagine. In our weakest moment is when he is the most strong. They're still praying. Let them just keep praying. I'm going to close us. God, we come today, and I thank you that you do not make mistakes. God, you take what we consider the brokenness and the trash and the failures, and you sit there and go, wow, that looks like a great stage for my glory. <laughs> God, you're good at making great stages for your glory. God, you took some of the most unlikely people in all of history and used them in the most unlikely situations. And you are glorified because of it. God, I just pray that you would take and use me in the most unlikely situations. Burr the fire inside of the bones of the people in this room, the people on the live stream, every person who's not here today. God, birth in their bones right now just a new vision, a new fire, a new zeal. God, I pray that for those that are listening or in the overflow or, or wherever, God, I just pray that they would wake up to the fact that you are calling us out in such a time, in this time, God, to be something we've never been before. God, if we're stuck, get us up. God, I just, I, I don't, I will never glorify a sin lifestyle in any way, shape, or form. But God, I will just pray right now that we would not allow our lifestyle to dictate our future. God, we know what's right and we know what's wrong. 
But God, I also pray that we would know what we lose in those moments and what we have to gain. I thank you and I praise you for another beautiful, amazing day that we can stand together, advance the kingdom, move the bubble. And God, I just pray that we would see this be a a groundswell across the nation of people saying, you know what? We're going to live a different life. We're going to speak a different language. And we're going to take back territory lost. We thank you and praise you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. God bless you guys. It's good seeing your face. Remember, Friday night, Warrior Course Setup. Sunday afternoon at 3, competition. And then next week, Warrior Camp. You will not want to miss it. It's going to be amazing. God bless you guys and have a great week.